elementary school or middle school, what I wanted to be when I grew up, it was, uh, it was always a writer. It was always, I want to have a book with my name on the cover. Um, but my path to becoming a fiction writer was very strange. Uh, there's actually someone here. Yo, Cassandra, where are you? Yeah, Cassandra. Uh, I've known Cassandra for a long time, a long time now. Um, probably as long as I've been since I was back in Long Beach. Um, I've had this very strange path to being a writer. I was a pop culture writer and a journalist for a long time. Um, sort of, I, I, I spent a long time writing about music and writing about the music industry and going on tour with bands and writing about that. And which was very much a dream, especially because music is, is a huge love in my life. And um, it wasn't until my late twenties that I was like, but you still want to write a book and you haven't actually gotten one published. You have written books and nothing has happened with them. Um, and so it was in my late twenties that I got an idea for something that I thought would be compelling enough and long enough to make a book. And that was in 2012. It took about a year and a half to write one draft of that book. And that is the book that became Anger is a Gift, which didn't come out for almost six years after that. Um, and even then my journey was very different too, because even though I was working on fiction, I had a whole, I, I called it a job because I treated it like a job. Um, but I was doing, you know, uh, book reviews and TV reviews. And it was this big, very important, very wonderful experience that I had running this website or these set of websites that I refer to as Marked as Stuff, um, which is Mark Reads and Mark Watches. And so, you know, I started off commenting on fiction and then in 2018 is when Anger is a Gift came out and now I'm exclusively writing my own fiction. Um, and so, you know, it was a very strange path. I, I didn't have that thing where I went to college, got an MFA, published, and then that's just the thing that I did. I have had this sort of circuitous, very strange path to becoming a writer, but this is the thing that I've always wanted to do. And in particular, the, the thing that is interesting is that I've pretty much gravitated to writing for children. Um, what we in the industry coll colloquially refer to as kid lit, I've kind of always stuck in that area. Um, and I know a lot of that is because of my upbringing and a lot of it is this motivation to write stories for kids who don't normally see themselves in fiction. And so that's been a huge motivation for the stories that I write. I, someday I'll write in a, I guess technically in Empire Strikes Back, the Wampa story is like an adult story because like it's an adult Wampa, but it's also like it's a space creature. So I don't know how much that counts as like an adult story. So someday I'll write for adults, maybe. I don't know. I'm, I'm having a blast writing pretty exclusively for kids and middle school kids right now. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, technically, I don't know if this counts for anything, but we have it categorized in the adult section. So take that for what it is but i feel like it has crossover i think you know yeah. young people like star wars yeah. um i kind of have to ask because i'm a bit of a, a a star wars nerd was that are you are you a are you a big star wars person i have a full sleeve of star okay. wars on my arm like i got the death star hanging out up here so yes it oh. was from a childhood my dad uh it was the thing that my dad and i bonded over is, uh, when i was growing up i probably saw that original trilogy a hundred times total by the time i was 10 years old that was you know, like kids have a thing that they hyper focus on and they know every word that it was for me, it was the original Star Wars trilogy. Um, so yes, it was, it was, I remember getting that email like, hey, we know you like Star Wars and you write, do you want to write a story for the, and I mean, I was like, I told my agent, I was like, I don't care what the details are, the answer is yes. And he was like, maybe we should find out what the details, I was like, no, it doesn't matter. I'll give them my soul. I'll go have a child and give my firstborn child up to do this. Like, this is like dream. Like, you had to write for the thing that made you, you know, appreciate fantasy and, and science fiction. Like, so it was a no brainer for me. Uh, wasn't easy though. It was terrifying. Like, this, it's Star Wars. Like, and not only that, like, this specific anthology, like, from a certain point of view, is you have to write within existing canon and you have to write only from one specific character. And this, these anthologies in particular tend to be about the characters who don't really have lines, who don't really have large, and so you have to invent a story. And so I actually, I only pitched them two and one of them was taken. And so there, and the, it was uh, Winrow Hood, who is the dude with the weird ice cream mach like maker machine who's in Beston City in Cloud City um, at the end of Empire Sparks Back. So I was like, initially I wanted him, there was someone already took him. So I was like, can I write the Wampa? who attacks Luke and they were like, sure. 
And then I turned in my weird space gentrification story and somehow it got published. I, I still to this day, I'm like, I don't, I can't believe they got, let me get away with that. Like, uh, it was an amazing, amazing experience. I would do it again in a heartbeat, but um, yeah, well, how surreal that is, like to get to be able to write for the thing that made your childhood wonderful. Yeah. Is, was it a little intimidating? Cause you know, Star Wars fans can be pretty rabid. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was more concerned about writing something that is so iconic, not just Star Wars in general, but like anyone who's seen the, it's the Wampa, like how do you make a story out of that? So it was more, it was more of a challenge of, I, I was less concerned about like, let me make the fans happy and more so like, I just want to do this right. And I want to do a story that makes sense so I remember once I chose the one, but I sat and, you know, I have the, the Empire Strikes Back on Blu-ray and I just repeatedly watched. There's like a 12, it's only 12 minutes in the whole movie in which this creature is there and just looking and being like, what are ways that I can fill in the gap? How can I make this thing come, get to this point? And how do you fill that in? Um, and so, yeah, that was where the intimidation was, was I have to come up with something compelling enough that a a very intense, hardcore Star Wars fan is like, okay, you did your homework. But then also someone who, who's a casual fan, or maybe, I don't know, maybe you haven't, I don't know who's picking this up who hasn't seen Empire Strikes Back, but if that is the case, is it still entertaining? Is there still a plot arc, like a beginning, middle, and an end? Um, so yeah, that very, very intimidating. Um, and it actually kind of made me uh, think, kind of, you have a knack of just writing across not just like genre, but also, you know, a good balance of writing long form novels and short fiction. And this is a super ended question, so we could take it piece by piece. But how is your approach different for, you know, maybe I'll focus on genre. How is it? How is your approach? Is it different for writing for different genre? Um, oh, that's a good question. I don't know that I've ever thought of it that way. Uh... I was sitting here ready to answer like, oh, this is how I do short story versus uh, like long form. Um, but genre, I mean, I will say that, you know, I don't know if you know this, Anger's a Gift did not start out as contemporary. It was initially as I thought I was writing this grand science fiction trilogy set in like a slightly distant future. And it was through the process of trying to find an agent that I got feedback from an agent who ended up being my actual agent um, that I was doing. It's a very common thing, which is that first time novelists tend to have the kitchen sink approach, which is your, this is your chance. You might get in the publishing industry with this thing. So I'm gonna put everything I love in one book. And he thankfully gave me the advice that let's slow down. Maybe you only should choose one of these things and save some ideas for something else, but let's give this book focus. So I that was also intimidating on a completely different level because I had never really sat down and written a purely contemporary story. And I didn't think that I had the tools or the wisdom to write contemporary fiction. But I spent so many years writing journalism where you're writing about the real world. It's actually not that much different. So I found as I was writing it, I was like, oh, okay. I do actually have these muscles in my brain that I do know how to use. Um, and I will say with Each of Us the Desert, I sat down and the first draft of that story was like, I really wanted to write this dystopian book. Um, I thought about sending it in the you know distant, distant future. I did not plan to write a fantasy book. So to answer your question is, I hope in future projects, I figure out what genre I'm gonna write when I start writing a book, because I, I don't seem to be getting that right. With both of these, both of my YA books, I wrote it in the, the wrong genre for the story and had to do these massive rewrites. Um, I never saw myself as a fantasy author. I like fantasy, but just was like, I don't think that that's my thing. Um, and while it was, enormously fun and and such an intellectual challenge to attempt fantasy i have like a new appreciation for fantasy books because that shit is hard it is so hard it's because there's just very basic things that you have an assumption of when you're building a world when you're telling a story that you can't actually assume anymore because you have a reader coming into it especially if you're a, 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 a fantasy savvy reader who's coming into a book and they know it's fantasy I wrote this assuming someone is going to pick it up and they don't know. They don't know that it's fantasy. They're just like, I'm, I'm going to read this book. So that means everything that you come across, there has to sort of be a reason that it's there, especially when you're doing secondary worlds. So the world in each of us, the desert is entirely invented. So I had to think about what does clothing look like? This is a world in which the world is literally all a desert. Well, not all of it. You'll learn that there's some other things there, but 
the, the world of the main characters, the characters who are interacting on a daily basis, everything around them is a desert. So what does water look like there? Where do they get it? How do they treat it? Is it uh, almost something that they revere? Is it something that they're afraid of? What sort of societies pop up if you live in a world where things are very stretched out and very far apart and very rural? Um, some of that came from my upbringing. I grew, I grew up uh, out in, in Riverside, so in the Inland Empire. And even though Riverside is not necessarily a small city by any means, it certainly has that mentality of you're very far from everything cool. You're far from everything that's happening. You know, I grew up around lots of farmland. I grew up, uh, my house was right behind a wildlife preserve. So I was used to like, there isn't a city around me. I just go outside of my house and it's hills and, and the Santa Ana River and whatnot. And so I wanted to write a book that, that it had that feeling of like things are very far apart, things are literally far apart, but also this sense of there is a greater world very distant from where I am. And what does that feel like growing up when you feel like everything great is happening completely out of your reach? Um, so yeah, my, my process became vastly different. I had to do so much more planning for each of us a desert. Um, and you've read it, so you also know that there are two or three very intricate plots where things have to happen at certain times. I mean, I had to I had to draw a map. I had to do an actual timeline because parts of the story happen out of order. Uh, one day, maybe I'll write a simple, straightforward book, but uh, I just turned in my, my third YA book and it is also completely out of order. And yeah, it's hard. I make it hard for myself. But yeah, I do approach writing them very, very differently. You know, this next book um, that I think is out next year, my next YA book is I go back to the contemporary world. And that was, it was actually hard to like get my brain back into that because um, I spent so much time inventing the world. And, and, and when you set things in something that is familiar, I do think there is a lot less work you have to do as an author. If I explain to you, like you go through a door, you know what a door is. I had to sit and think like, what do doors look like? And so that they don't have, if you know, it was a very intentional thing. There are almost no doors in each of us a desert because I wanted to have a set uh, where you got the sense that wind could blow through buildings to cool it down. And so I talk about like burlap hangings a lot. Um, so it's stuff like that, that I never thought I would do as a writer. And, and now that became part of that process for that book. And I imagined for each book, while I may build on things that I learned from the last one, I do find that my process changes with each manuscript. I'm uh, just hearing you talk about world building. Does it then, especially with each of us, a desert kind of hearing how much work you put into it is it become hard to let that go like you you put so much work into it and no you know? no it wasn't hard to let go because i had to rewrite each of us a desert twice completely fully rewrite through the editing process so by the time we got to like the beginning of 2020 i had put so much work in that book i was like i please take this and put it out into the world i mean i was very proud of it of, of it and that work but um an interesting thing is, is I really, I found that I really like writing standalones. I haven't written a series of the many books that I have contracted that I haven't even announced that are coming out in the, in the next few years. They're all standalones as well. And for me, psychologically, I like it because it means that I can have an ending and then it's done. And so I did, I will admit that I did build a slight open thing in each of us that does it that I don't want to spoil so that if I do want to come back to it, there is another story to be told. But no, I, I feel like I told the story that I wanted to. I feel like I interacted with the world that I created in the ways that I wanted to. Um, you know, there is a, a narrative device throughout each of us a desert where when Sochil takes a story, you, the reader, get to actually experience it, which was my way of showing other parts of the world that the main character couldn't get to. So that you got this sense of how huge this world was, that you know um, other characters are dealing with different climates. Uh, you know, it's not until one of the characters gives a story to Zochil that she sees. I don't want to tell you, but she, she sees a thing like she experiences a whole climate that she didn't even know existed. Um, which I feel like for me was both a literal and metaphor metaphorical representation of that small town living. Like you don't, you know, growing up in Riverside you know, the ocean just seems like 
it wasn't until we traveled to it that you're like, oh, right, there's an ocean. And, and people, you know, I get that all the time, uh, especially, you know, living here in New York. They're like, oh, you lived in California? I bet you went to the beach all the time. I was like, the beach was two hours away on, on a good day with no traffic on the 10 or the 60. Like, maybe we could get to the beach in two hours. But no. And, you know, it was an hour and a half to climb up into the San Bernardino Mountains and see forests. So, and when you're poor and when you don't have a lot of time for those sort of things, it felt very constricted. Like I lived in this tiny bubble. What does the world look out like, like outside of that? And I feel like metaphorically, that's what each of us a desert is to me, is that kid just longing to find out what the world is like outside of it. Yeah, I, I really appreciate how you're able to so openly and willingly put so much of yourself into your books. I think that's, um, that's, I mean, I'm thinking from the perspective of a, of a young writer, that must be hard to, to do, right? To be so um, vulnerable. Is, does that ever get easier? Yeah. Oh, it's easier now. I was not with, with anger as a gift. There's a lot of very personal stuff in there that, <laughs> that I put in there. And then I had like very close friends be like, is this how you feel? And I was like, yeah, sorry. I just told everyone instead of just telling you. Um, it, um, I also, you know, and if Cassandra could join in on this, Cassandra could vouch for me. I, I got my start like being very open and vulnerable on the internet. Uh, Cassandra and I know each other because we both follow the same band, this band AFI, whose shirt, a t-shirt I'm actually wearing today. Um, and, you know, I was a huge participant in their, in their online message board. And for me, that was that glimpse to the outside world going and also going to school in Long Beach where I got to be out for the first time in my life and get to be myself. And I, I see my early twenties as not only me pushing the envelope in some ways that were actually genuinely terrible, but also as like, I'm trying to figure out who I am. And a lot of that came with, that was the early internet culture of like people beginning to share who they are. And so then when I moved into my like journalism career and I started writing about music, there was always a personal angle to it because I just felt like that was the best way I could tell a story. So when I was touring with bands, when I was writing about them, it wasn't just, here's this band, they're going on tour, but I often made it very personal, not only for myself, but the band members too. And I would write these long, long articles about the loneliness of touring and what it's like to be so far from home, to go from the feeling like you went, that you had the best show of your entire life to a show where 10 people show up and then they all leave because you, you were the final band, but really you should be switching places with the band who was opening and like stuff like that. Um, and I, I see that personal angle as the thing, or at least at least I hope that's the thing that made me stand out finally, when I finally wrote Anger as a Gift, when I was looking for agents, and then when we ultimately sold it, is that there is that personal vulnerability. I think if there is a Marco Shiro brand, it is that, that there's always going to be a very vulnerable character at the center of it. Um, I think Moss and Anger as a Gift and Sochil and each of us at Desert are vulnerable in vastly different ways. Um, but I think that's always going to be sort of like a staple of the fiction that I write. So I will say now, I don't really think about it. I, I do what I think is best for the story. Um, and I'm not so concerned about, well, what does it mean to be this vulnerable? I will say on the flip side, though, it does mean that I have very vulnerable personal responses to fiction, which is surreal. I also think it's a huge responsibility and I take it very seriously. You know, I've done so many school visits over the years. Um, and I'm right now, a one just popped in my head where I did a school visit outside of Dallas, Texas. And after my little visit was over to the classroom, like the class is excused, but two kids stuck behind to come up to me afterwards. And they had read anger as a gift for their class. And they came up to me afterwards and immediately came out to me. And then not only came out to me, but then the next words out of their mouth were, don't tell anyone we've never said this to anyone which is simultaneously both this flattering, amazing thing, but then also terrifying, because then you have to think like, there's no one in your life, this random stranger came to your school and I'm the only person you feel safe with. So it's, I don't like using the phrase double-edged sword because I don't like, connote, like connotating violence with what this experience is like. But I, what I mean in that metaphor is that it is a thing being vulnerable, I think, I hope adds a level of reality and a level of emotional weight to the stories that I write 
but it also means that there is a level of reality and emotional weight that I get back from people who often don't see themselves and in particular in anger is the gift with the depiction of you know complex PTSD and anxiety and depression and, and mental illness in general um, and so that's probably the only part I think about is I do want to portray things with care and sensitivity and I do think about what my responsibility is as an artist and as a writer to put things on the page but in terms of like my old stuff who cares I'm just gonna put whatever I want and whatever thing I feel is important to me that I want to talk about um I'll just I'll just say, I'll just close out this question with this is that this next book this young, uh next YA book that I wrote is easily the most personal most vulnerable I've ever written like this is a subject I have avoided writing about and talking about for years and I I'm very excited that that my agent read uh the manuscript and was like this is the most feral thing you've ever written what is going on like this is also everyone's gonna be super mad at you and I was like yes that's what I want I want you to all be upset um so yeah, no, I I I, don't, I only give it thought in terms of what responsibility I have as an artist. So that yeah, so a kind of a follow up. It's so the decision, it's it's conscious for you then to include what some might consider like social political aspects in your writing. I mean, yes, it is. It is though. I've certainly done things where it was unconscious, where I didn't realize that I was doing it. Um, I had so there's a character named Here's a Gift named Esperanza. And I was writing specifically from the experience of being a transracial adoptee, even though I am Latino um, and that's what my birth parents are, I was, I'm adopted. And so I have a white mom and a Japanese Hawaiian dad, which is why my last name is Japanese. Um, and so I wanted to put a transracial adoptee in a book, but Esperanza's experience is not my own. It's very, very different. And I wanted to comment on a very specific niche sort of complicated issue, fully not intending some of the responses that I've gotten to it and, and what people assume that I'm talking about. I, I did an event in DC the day after Anger's Gift came out. So this was May 23rd, 2018. Uh, it was in DC with Jason Reynolds, which was, oh, yo, he's the nicest, also so smart, and boy, he will not ask easy questions at all. Um, and afterwards, this older gentleman, I'd say he's like late 40s, comes up to me and was like, I bought this book last night. I read it overnight. It blew my mind. I had to come here and thank you for it. But I wanted to tell you that me and my husband, we uh, adopted a young Latina girl. And now I think we need to have a very uncomfortable conversation about how we've raised her. And I was like, oh, okay. And they were like, you know, thank you for making me think of all these difficult questions and all these different problems. And I'm sitting there like, I wasn't writing for you. Like, I, this is not the intended message of this book. I think there was a part of me later that was like, did I just ruin his family? Like, oh my God, what have I done? Like spiraling with guilt, like this is, so that's the thing, there are intentional things. I wanted to write about privilege and the way people can be privileged and not realize it. And it was, it's not for adults, it's, for, it's a book for kids. So I'm not writing to change an adult's mind ever. That's not, I'm just never on the plate. And then here's this adult coming to me like, oh, I think you changed my mind. I'm like, yes, I planned that the whole time, but I didn't. And so, yes. I, I think most of the themes are intentional, but that's how art works too, is there's so much you can read into something and so many things that people can claim are intentional and read into it. And to be quite honest, as someone who's reviewed books and TV for years, I think a lot of those interpretations are valid. Even if the original author didn't intend it, things can come across. So that being said, I do feel like I am pretty intentional about the things that end up in my books. I knew it was gonna happen. Sorry, somebody came up to the window and is like waving at me like I'm in a zoo. Sorry, I'm so sorry. Um, oh, 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 something happened. Somebody raised their hand briefly. Uh, if you have a, if you have a question, uh, go ahead and submit it. Um, There's a Q&A thing. It's like down at the bottom. Yeah. Q and A. Um, you kind of touched on it. I want to kind of jump back on it before we get too far away. You mentioned your experience writing for, for music and like music journalism. Uh, somebody wanted to know how music and then specifically hardcore punk, because they see your tattoos, uh, influenced your writing at all. Ooh. Other than AFI. Other than, I mean, um, 
I think there's like a punk ethos and 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 sensibility to anger as a gift. Absolutely. I mean, the song, the book is named after a reference to Freedom by Rage Against the Machine. Um, it's a lyric from from that song. I think there's you know a lot of music references in the book, but I also think the ethos of you know supporting your fellow humans, um, the importance of protest. I think all of that is so. I don't know. For me, angry it feels very obvious in anger is a gift. I don't think it is obvious in my in some of my other books, but it influences certain things. Like, uh, for example, Each of Us a Desert is the first time I've written poetry in a really really long time. All of the poems that are in the book I wrote, and I also I wrote them originally in Spanish. I did not write them in English and translate them. Uh, it was a very important thing for me. And the last time I really wrote poetry extensively was when I was in bands, because I consider song lyrics to basically be poetry. So I was, I think that it was also very scary to start doing because I was like, do I even know how to do this anymore? I don't know really know how to do this anymore. So there's that element of it. There's some music stuff in the insiders. Um, I'm I to be honest, I'm waiting until I have the right idea. But I really want to write a punk rock, like a literal punk rock YA book. I feel like I've been listening to punk rock and hardcore since I was eight or nine years old. I have such extension, extensive knowledge and experience with it. And I know I know I could write a great book. I just haven't quite had the right idea. I've had, had a few that are close. Um, so I think more, it, it tends to be more the philosophy and the things that I learned from hardcore bands. Like I think about how much I learned because of bands like Bikini Kill or Bad Brains or Propagandi or, or Bad Religion, like bands who are so expressly political that they then taught me things because I would read their lyrics and I'd be like, what are you actually talking about? I don't understand what this reference is. And like, I feel like I know so much about Canadian history and pop culture because propaganda, like this band I've been listening to forever. And I know so much, like I know what Coach's Corner is, this weird hockey show. And I know who Don Cherry is. And I could like write an essay right now about how much Don Cherry sucks. Like I wouldn't know those things if it wasn't for my love of punk rock. So. It, te it, it tends to be more metaphorical representations of it, but I, I someday my goal of my career is to write a YA punk rock book. I just, I don't know what it is yet. It might be YA 4, because I have an idea where I think I could fit it in there, but I, I don't know yet. I really want to know. That's, I'm so thrilled. But yeah, yeah, I will be first in line to read that one. That sounds awesome. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, somebody asked a question. Um, I forgot to mention we're doing all of a bunch of uh, summer reading programs uh, for the summer. One of them yeah. is video game design. So this might be where this came from. But somebody wants to know, uh, are you, or first of all, probably you should ask, are you into gaming at all? Are you a gamer? OK. If there's a gaming world that you could live in, or yeah, what would it be? Oh, that, that I could live in. Oh. I mean, I have, I have different answers for different reasons. My immediate thought was, I'm a big fan of the Borderlands games. Um, which if you're not played are like a first person shooter, but a, they're a joke, but they're also serious. They tend to make fun of first person shooters, but I really like them because they're some of the only first person shooters that are like explicitly queer. And then there's a lot of main characters who are queer, who are ace, who are bisexual, who are pan. Uh, I love that part about it. I also love uh, that you can die in that world and you just get digitally recreated. So there's no death and I'm like, that's cool. Because here's the thing, it, once you said that question, I was like, oh, any worlds that I like, I would die in all of them. Like, I would not last in all of them. So let me choose Borderlands, so at least I have that save point and can be digitally reconstructed all the time. Um, in terms of, like, beauty, I would love to explore the world of Breath of the Wild. The uh, That game is just gorgeous, and I feel like I would have a good time. Because there's so much you could do that isn't threatening in that game. Um, and then I'm going to throw a wild card in, which is that I just want to do it, is the Katamari games, like Katamari Damacy, which is that weird Japanese game where you're a little alien prince and your king father sends you to Earth to roll a ball and you just pick up trash. And it, I just love those games and how silly they are. And it's not about anyone getting hurt and you just pick up trash and it's very sanitary. And there's something super comforting about that. So those, that's my answer. Yeah, fantastic answers. I yes, I beat Breath of the Wild for the first time like a week ago. So cool. Oh, yeah. I'm thirty hours in. Have I finished ten percent of the game? Probably not. I can't. I'm. You give me an open world game, 
I will do every side quest. I will find everything. I'm the person who stumbles into areas that I should be level 800 that I don't. That's me. I just go and I wander forever. Like I remember, That was me with Skyrim too. I've never completed a Skyrim game because I just get lost. I build settlements. I have like 50 dogs who I have to feed every day. Like I just get into the weird mundane thing and I'm like, conflict story? Who cares? I'm going to take care of my dogs. Actually, does do you find yourself bringing video games into your writing at all or is it are those two separate worlds or? Do I? I don't know. I think, I don't, I don't know that I do consciously. I will say I do tend to have actually a more cinematic brain. I borrow a lot from movies um, more than anything else. And in fact, I, when I am writing pieces, I like to imagine what the visual counterpart would look like. That's how I, that's how my brain works in when I have to describe things or do action pieces or whatnot. Um, I don't, I, the other thing is I've never written like a, a very high action story yet. I'm sitting, oh boy. I'm sitting here saying that and I'm like, mark your mind, you actually have, but I, I can't talk about it. I will, and it was hard. I will say it was very difficult because I tend to write a lot more contemplative, long, slow pieces but I did write something that was super fast paced and a lot of action and it was a huge challenge. Um, but I, I don't know that I thought of it as a video game more so as I thought of it as a movie and how would that look and how do you, because I, I didn't realize what a skill that is to be able to describe action set pieces so that it's legible for a, a reader. You have to be able to communicate where a person is physically, where they are, what it feels like, all of this stuff. And I'm like, that's a whole new, thing that I'm not as good at. Not that there isn't physical stuff in my book, but I mean, you've read each of that. It's not, it's a nightmare, but it's like not like a constant, you know, high throttle adventure kind of thing. I feel like that's a, that's a new area that I would like to experiment with. Like, how do I write what I do, but also have like high amounts of action? I don't know yet. But yeah, it tends to be more movies than, than video games. Do you want to? Uh, do you have any like specific movies that you you feel want to share that influence? No. Okay. Yes. Let's do this because I never get to talk about this. Uh, each of us together, each of us a desert is. What if M Night Shyamalan's The Village was a good movie? I'm not even kidding you. It is 900% the reason the book exists. Is that I hate. The village so much because there is a fantastic you should not have asked this question i have an hour-long lecture prepared for all of you look i'll just here's the brief version there is a good movie hiding in and that shaman's the village the problem is it's a structural mess because the big twist happens 17 minutes before the end of the movie yes i measured because i wrote a whole long essay about this 17 minutes before the end of the movie the twist is revealed about what that movie is about it is the most interesting thing the movie does and then it's over and I have been obsessed with this mistake for years since it came out because I was so hyped about that movie. I love the cast, all those original trailers. We all thought we were in for the ride of our lives and I was so disappointed. And if you think about, if you've seen The Village or you can go read the Wikipedia or whatever, look it up and then think about each of us the desert because I do a village-like twist about 20% into the book. And I made the thing that changes a person's world happen early because I want to explore the rest. That for me, that and I'll say this too, that's what I find compelling about young adult fiction. I feel like young adult fiction, no matter the genre, no matter the, you know, whether it's younger YA, older YA, I feel like what makes that age group so interesting to writing about is that we are writing about transitional stages. This is the stage between childhood and adulthood. And generally speaking, most YA books are dealing with a character who has to grapple with their whole entire world changing before them. Even in the quietest contemporaries, even in the most action-packed thrillers, something is, some rug is pulled out from underneath them and their understanding of the whole world has to change because that's what it means to become an adult. And so I wanted that to happen early so that we could actually explore the ramifications of someone realizing their world might not actually be true. Um, so that's my, I, I'm not even kidding you. I once wrote, it never got published, like an 8,000 word essay about why M. Night Shyamalan's The Village is terrible. And here's the book I wrote in response. I I hope that gives you a sense of what kind of nerd that I am, that I can that, I'm like, 
I'm so petty. I wrote a whole novel in response to a movie. That's that's what that's what I do. We definitely uh, do not uh, support M Night Shyamalan around here, especially I'm an Avatar fan. So, oh, uh, what he did to the movie, yeah. Boo! Absolutely not. Terrible, <laughs> terrible, terrible. That I mean, we could turn this into M Night Shyamalan and critical analysis because I have thoughts about him. Because when he is good, great, fantastic, but he's just so caught up and we can't do this right now anyway <laughs> that's actually an interesting point because i was going to ask do you find your because your blog you're doing a lot of sort of media analysis maybe criticism do you find that that informs your writing at all other than okay yeah actually and i tell this too is so i went to cal state long beach um i started as a creative writing major i only lasted one semester because the program there was not suited for me and i mean to on a much darker note, it wasn't suited to me because I was one of two non-white kids in the class. And the professor that I had for my short story workshop outright told me at one point that no kids, no one would want to read my stories because no one wants to read about your people. And it was just one of those things where I was like, oh, this is not, I can't learn about what I need to learn from you. It's not going to happen. Um, I ended up being a political political science major. I ended up switching because I thought maybe if I learn about the world, if I learn about activism, there's some way that I could use that to, to sort of help my writing. And so I, that definitely informed the politics and anger is a gift of, amongst many other things. But I see my job or my, my experience with Mark Reed's in particular, where I've been, you know, in August is 12 years. I've been doing this website for 12 years, right, you know, reviewing books. To me, that's my MFA is picking apart books chapter by chapter and talking about things like theme and pacing and structure and whatnot and getting to see. There was another interesting thing about it is that I, I, I've covered some very long series uh, on Mark Reed's, um, you know, and I don't just mean long things like, you know, Twilight or, or Harry Potter or, or The Hunger Games, which were the three that I started off with, but I then started doing entire author's body of work. So I've read with the exception of one book, all of Tamara Pierce's work. Um, uh, almost, not all, but all, I've read all of the Discworld books. I haven't read a lot of Terry Pratchett's other stuff. And one of the very unique things about getting to read someone's publication history in order is getting to see them grow as a writer. And I think that's an education for me, is seeing what are the things that they change? Oh, they used to do this a lot. They don't do this anymore. They don't, sometimes it's as simple as here are words they don't use anymore. Two, when you get on, you're like, oh, you're trying a much more complicated structure thing. There's this narrative framing device in this book that you've never attempted before. This is first person, this is third person. Why do each of these things work? How do they not work and whatnot? So yeah, I don't, I fully do not think I would be who I am and be the writer I am if I had not done that. And, I, and let's bring it back around to Long Beach, that book that I wrote when I was 19 years old that I finished in 2004 when I was 20. Um, Part of the reason, I mean, look, I also didn't know what I was doing. I, when I was finished with it, I printed it out. It was like 180 pages and I sent it to like every editor that I could find. I didn't look up whether they published young adult fiction or anything. I just sent it to editors and then sent it to a bunch of agents and being like, they'll read it. Um, I only got four responses. They were all four rejections. And when I went back and, and when I was rereading this book, I was like, oh, I can see why I made these choices that I did, but they're not good choices. These are not good writing choices. There's so many better things you can do, but I don't think I would have the knowledge to have been able to look at that manuscript and pick apart the things I liked that were good ideas if I hadn't spent 12 years picking apart other people's fiction and then being able to do it to my own. Um, so yeah, it's for me, that's been my education. That is the reason I, I I am the writer that I am and that I have the taste that I do um, is from doing something like that. That's awesome. And so then with given all of your wealth of experience, thinking about out there who might be interested in writing or pursuing a career in this, what what kinds of things would you recommend as sort of like, Ooh. like what's some required reading or like some, some Okay. Where did, where did it start? That's a big question. Yeah. Uh, oh, so required reading. There's a book. It's it's not that old. I don't. I can't tell you the the year it came out. Um, I know a lot of my friends have sort of discovered it recently. Uh, it's called Craft in the Real World. Craft in the Real World by uh, I don't remember the author's name, but there's only one book by it. Highly, 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 highly recommend. It's it is probably my favorite actual craft narrative book. 
Um, I would also recommend if you struggle with it, and I, I, I will say only if you struggle with it, if you feel like you have a good grasp, maybe it's not necessary, but is to look up books specifically about structure, about three act structure. Um, there is, I'm trying to think, Save the Cat, that's the name of it. Uh, Save the Cat is by, uh, oh, Matthew Silesis. Thank you for putting that in there, Julian. Um, Julian, uh, Save the Cat, who wrote Save the Cat? Is Blake Snyder. Blake Snyder, um, I know, yeah, it is a book. It's called Save the Cat, the last book on screenwriting you'll ever need. And so I'm gonna, even though you may not be writing a screenplay, it is actually a fantastic book if you are thinking of writing commercial fiction and you want to stick to like, three to five act structures, things that feel like they fit into what would be a very commercial story. Um, I, I give that recommendation not to say that this is how you need to write books because I actually don't write any of my books with a normal structure. Uh, Anger is a Gift and especially Each of Us a Desert. Like, so for example, Anger is a Gift, one of the things that I, I've gotten feedback on that frustrates people is that it's not the traditional hero's narrative in that the character doesn't get everything that they actually wanted and saves the day at the end, even though there is some form of a victory at the end. And people are frustrated by that. And that is me eschewing the sort of Western idea that stories have to end in this certain way where the bow is all wrapped up or whatnot. And then Each of Us a Desert is technically circular in this way that like some people are like, what, what is going on with this book? Um, so. I will give these recommendations and say that they are wonderful things to give you information that you may not have, but they're not Bibles. They're not, this is the only way to write. When I am writing, I find with short stories, I find something like Save the Cat to be an incredible resource of like, I need to knock out this story and you need to have beginning, middle, end. How do I do a three act structure in 3,000, 4,000 words? And that will help me sort of pare down a story. Um, so aside from required reading, some things that have helped me. Um, so I now have a part of my process and I figured it out by the second book. Um, I used to be the kind of writer who was, wouldn't outline, would just, it definitely did this with the book that I wrote when I was living in Long Beach is I just, just sat down and wrote and just kept going and going, didn't really plan anything. Uh, I also didn't know I had anxiety. That's a terrible way to do that because the unknown is what triggers my anxiety. And so I would just write and write and get stressed out like, why do I not know what's happening? I think of a terrible writer. And so I now outline everything. I figure out story beats beforehand because it works better for me. I will not say that outlining is for everyone, but it is it is how my heart works, it's how my brain works. But I would say the coolest bit of sort of writing process that's been a huge help for me is that I now do a thing that's called a zero draft. Everyone's heard of a first draft. It's the first thing you write. I write what is called a zero draft and it's called a zero draft uh, because, for two reasons. It's generally thought of that way because it's the draft that happens before the first draft, so it's the number zero. I think of it more as here is a draft that zero human beings on the planet will ever see. And I will write to just get the story out of my head and get it onto the page because I like to think of that draft that no, I don't show it to my agent, my editor doesn't see it. So I don't have as much this is the word I'm thinking. I don't have as much hesitation because I'm like, I can fix it later. It doesn't matter that these words are terrible or this sentence doesn't work or this is clunky or I'm skipping over things. The big thing for me that's important is just getting the story under the page because I like to think of it as when I'm doing a zero draft, I have taken the puzzle, the box that it's in, opened it, and all I've done is dump all the pieces onto the table. What all the versions are after that, the first draft, second draft, however many drafts it takes, the revision, it's putting together the pieces. I would say the first draft is figuring out where the edges are, where are the corners. And those are what are the main signposts that I've got to hit along the way of this book that I want to keep from the zero draft. What are the things that I think are actually going to work? These things fit in the beginning, the middle, the end or whatnot. And then as I revise, it's figuring out, oh, okay, here's this pattern here. And I notice these all match. Oh, these pieces must all be together. Cool, I've assembled this whole part of this book and I know this is it and then I'll move on. And that's what writing is to me, is putting together this elaborate puzzle. And so I, I often recommend the zero draft because so many people get hung up on this idea that the first draft they have right has to be good. And it has to be perfect and it has to be exactly what you imagine in your head. And some people, I have some friends who are fantastic first drafters. 
I hate them. I'm incredibly envious of them. I am not. I'm a very sloppy first drafter. So I've given into that and being like, you know what? That's okay. Write a very quick zero draft that you know no one is going to see. You don't feel as self-conscious about it. And then use revision to refine things and figure out the things that you want. Um, and again, any advice is never a, a thing that is set in stone. It is just what I think has worked for me and hopefully it can work for someone else. Yeah, that's that's, um, that's a good piece of advice yeah. to your advice. <laughs> um, I'm kind of curious too. Uh, we have like a few minutes left. I don't know if there'll be enough time for this, but before I ask my question, I want to see does anyone have any any questions for Mark before I make it about me? <laughs> you can also ask your question then while someone's hopefully okay. I can chat in the QA can drop a question. So, uh, you had mentioned oops, sorry, <laughs> Zoom. Um, so you had talked about um, sort of dealing with anxiety and how that has affected your writing process. How much of um, this this uh, idea of, of wellness and like focusing on mental health how much how much work do you personally have to put in to sort of balance the two things you know like writing let's see it worked it works better in my head no um, I, I feel like i know what you're saying too because there's like i'm immediately thinking of a few things one like how do you write a book like anger is a gift or each of us a desert which tend to be pretty intense like, how do you balance writing about these things while also caring for yourself? Yeah. And then there's also the logistical part of it, which is that writing is lonely. Writing is extremely difficult and super personal. Those are all things that could trigger, you know, mental health issues. Um, I will say that I feel very lucky and, and, and privileged to have a therapist. I'm going to recommend therapy if you can and are able. Oh my God, I don't know how I would have made it through the last two years without therapy. Um, so there's the personal angle, which is there is some self-care that I do exercise when I am writing in this sort of loops back to the vulnerability conversation we had earlier. There is some uh, self-care that I have to practice if I am being vulnerable. Um, a lot, a great deal of anger as a gift is so personal. And so I would frequently take breaks if I was writing a scene that felt particularly triggering of my, because I have complex PTSD like Moss does. So writing about it, even talking about it sometimes can be very difficult. So recognizing when I'm feeling anxious and when I'm writing and that it doesn't actually feel good and being like, it's okay to step away. And not only is it okay to step away, maybe write a different scene that isn't upsetting and you can come back to this and giving yourself permission, like that's okay. That doesn't make you a bad writer. You need to take care of yourself. Um, there are certainly some very personal things in each of us a desert that were difficult to deal with. It also relies, I have a great relationship with my editors and in particular, when we are editing difficult passages, I've never had, I think we've never had a problem with it and never had to bring it up, but both of my, my middle grade and my young middle editors have definitely been like, if this is difficult, we don't have to edit this scene today. You can do it in a later draft or whatnot, because I can tell this is very personal. Uh, and having that open dialogue with the actual professionals in your field. And then, you know, the other part, oh boy, so the past year and a half in particular has presented the new mental health struggle, which is how do you create while the world is falling apart? And unfortunately, I didn't get a chance to have a break. Uh, since January of last year, I've written four books. So I don't want to do that ever again. Let me just throw that out there. I'm very proud of it and I'm very proud of my work ethic, but I was telling a friend last night, like I'm exhausted mentally, physically, I don't want to, I don't want to have to do this. And a lot of it is just coincidence. A lot of us in publishing are dealing with our schedules, basically piling up on top of one another, especially those of us who are writing in two different age groups. And so I've had to figure out how do I create and feel inspired while also dealing with everything that's been happening in the world. And it, it is hard. And Part of it involves just the honesty of admitting it and being able to talk about it. I think that's a huge step. Therapy has been a huge step. Setting boundaries with, in a professional setting. Uh, a big thing that I've been exercising, especially in these last two months, is actually just saying no. No, I'm not going to do this event. No, I'm not going to do, no, I don't want to do this thing. And I think, especially for first-time authors, and I certainly did this in 2018, you have this sense that if you don't say yes to everything, you're never going to have a career. You're never going to get another book. 
And let me tell you now, three, it's been three years since my first book came out. Oh, it's not true. It is not true. You do not have to do everything. Choose the things that make you happy. Choose the things that make you feel seen and respected. You do not have to say yes to everything. Part of the reason I've had to write four books in the last year and a half is because I said yes to everything and thought that that was the path forward. And I can tell you from mental health reasons, it's not a great, it's not a great choice. At the same time, I want to recognize like what an amazing thing it is to be able to do that. I also feel very lucky that I still get to write books. Uh, I know it is not an easy thing to do. And some people don't get a chance to write a second book. And I'm at, and I next month I start book seven, which is like this is so exciting. And I wish I could tell all of you about these books, but that's the other thing. Publishing is full of secrets. So get a therapist so you at least have someone you can legally tell your secrets to. Uh, it's great because they can't tell anyone. My therapist is literally the only human being besides my agent who knows all of the books that are coming. I'm very excited. That's cool. Do they have to yeah. sign an NDA too? <laughs> Uh, no, because they're protect it's medically protected. Mm. But okay, good. I mean, I hope I have to because I've told them, well, I'm going to have a meltdown when this is over and be like, I was I supposed to tell them? Oh, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. There's <laughs> Let's see. Um, well, that, I feel like that's a good, good note to end on. If there aren't any other questions, I'll give you all one more chance. Thank you so much. Um, so much for this by the way and for your like really wonderful insightful questions and i mean this it felt more like a discussion too than just like a back and you know like one side of thing and i really appreciate that oh yeah no thank you so much for being here especially you know knowing that you know it is tough and we are trying to i think it's a time that a lot of people are reevaluating their boundaries so the fact that you chose to be here with us today just i'm so grateful thank you so much absolutely so excited to be a part of this and and have this sort of like, you know, I feel like very roundabout thing because I, I got, I feel like I got my creative start in Long Beach and, and, you know, I've been telling friends all week how surreal this feels to me. You know, this is the thing that like so many artists dream of is you get your start somewhere and you have the hustle and you have the grind and you work so, so hard. And, you know, here I am 17, 18 years later and it's finally happening not happening has happened and continues to happen and 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 it feels so wonderful and the fact that like those all those books behind you like i either wrote the whole book or have part like fairly large parts of that it's just ah oh, it's very it's very surreal it's very surreal so thank you thank you very much um oh the last bit of business for those of you who are like super excited about uh the participants uh, if you're excited about the drawing that was promised. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and probably do it after the fact. So you'll get an email if you want. So there was like a prize uh, thing. Uh, there were, uh, the winner will receive a pack of some books that I am really excited about. Obviously you're gonna get Mark's book, duh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All Boys Aren't Blue by George Johnson. Oh, it's so good. Really, really good. Uh, I haven't read this yet, so no spoilers, but last night at the Telegraph Club. I would grab it, but it's like right over here. Melinda Lowe is a legend. I'm so excited. It's going to be great. And then uh, my personal favorite from oh. the, was it 2019? Uh, Pet. So yeah. uh, keep an eye on your emails and you might be a winner and you'll get all four. We'll arrange the details for pickup uh, at a later date. So um, thank you all for, again for being here. Thank you so much, Mark, for being here. Everyone have a wonderful day. Take care of yourselves. Be well. And goodbye. Thank you, everyone.